I'm Katie Cowan, and this is the Creative Boom Podcast. Our next guest is the acclaimed American graphic designer, author, and scholar, Louise Sandhouse. A professor at the California Institute of the Arts, Louise is also the principal of Louise Sandhouse Design, which she founded in 1998. Born in Massachusetts, Louise began her career in the 1970s and has since seen new technology disrupt and change the creative industries in ways many of us can't imagine, from the birth of the Apple computer to the software tools we still use today. Just recently, thanks to the internet, Louise has launched the permanent home for the People's Graphic Design Archive to preserve graphic design history for future generations, but also to act as a source of inspiration for creative professionals everywhere. She's one of its four co-founders, an online platform rooted in a passion for celebrating the output of our industry and learning from our previous creations. In this episode, we talk about new technology, how it transformed her own career and why it's a force for good today. We discuss the rising tide of AI and its potential impact with tools like Dali. And we delve into Louise's own path to success, the challenges she's overcome and the rewards she's enjoyed along the way. We really understand why preserving graphic design is a real labour of love for Louise and why it's so important that we somewhat remove the gatekeepers to celebrate all kinds of work and champion the unsung creators whose voices are often not heard. As she so beautifully puts it, everything and everyone is valued when you have something that anyone can contribute to. Well, it's so nice to um, finally meet you. Um, I know we're only doing this virtually, Louise, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to see your face. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's nice to see yours as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, how are you finding... Um, these sort of strange new times we're going through at the moment. What is what's it like over there on the west coast? Oh gosh. Well, we're we're feeling like we're in an island right now, although we've got our own problems. Yes, but it's a, it's fraught times. What can we say? You yeah, know, I just I, I keep hoping the the restart button is uh, is coming. <laughs> It's, it feels like it, we, we, you know, we enjoyed much simpler times back in the day. Um, I was just sort of uh, reading about you, and I noticed that um, obviously you uh, um, were working in the eighties, but um, you started your own um, studio in nineteen ninety eight, and gosh, it just felt like a really kind of peaceful time back then from what I can remember. You know, there was that cute little thing called Google that was just starting to take over Excite and Yahoo. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Yeah, I do. You know, I just remember I was um, I was in uh, Holland, I think it was at 1995, where I was uh, at the Jan van Eyck at the time. Oh, wow. And they had, yeah, they had one room that had a computer in it. And you could access it like late at night until (laughs) early in the morning. And it was like, you know, the internet was starting to happen. And, um, you know, it was the time that I could send email. That was like super exciting. But It was really exciting. And and text message was like this amazing thing. And do you remember Snake? (laughs) <laughs> or was it Caterpillar? Oh, I don't remember a snake. What was snake? <laughs> <laughs> it was this awful game on these, you know, these very um, clunky bricks of phones that we had, oh. you know, and you just <laughs> you just had to make the snake go around and eat up all the bits on the screen without crushing into its tail or uh, the walls. Okay. I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose it was kind of the equivalent of what all the kids have now. You know, they you can play pinball on your you know phone these days and all these incredible things. Things. And I, I don't think the kids of today realize how good they've got it, do they? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is that good? <laughs> well, honestly, um, yeah. the, techn- the technology during our lifetime and during our careers has tr- changed so much. I mean, um, have you always been someone that's embraced those sort of uh, new technological advances or have you been sort of slightly apprehensive at first and sort of reluctant? I mean, how, how have you sort of adapted over the years? Yeah. So you started off mentioning the 1980s. And so in the 1980s, I was in Boston. Yeah. And of course, that's where MIT and the Media Lab is, mm-hmm. was. And um, at that time, 
I was living in Cambridge Port, um, and I met this woman who went on to become very influential to me and to others, and that was Muriel Cooper. The late, great. The late, great Muriel Cooper. And so at the time, um, the Visual Language Workshop had not been formed. You know, it was in its kind of like infancy when I when I met her. And so, you know, just through having conversations with her through the years, I could see how the computer was going to impact what we were doing as graphic designers, Mm -hmm. um, what we were doing, how we were doing it. And, you know, it was actually, that was in part why I went on to graduate school. So I did embrace it early on. I was also working for a magazine at the time. Mm -hmm. And the publisher of that magazine was really interested in computers and what they might do. And we had a CompuGraphic typesetting machine And he was working with some like people who were programmers or computer scientists or whatever they were. And he kind of figured out how to write that we could control the output that was coming out of this early typesetting machine or, you know, early relative. But what might be considered, um, you know, kind of um, photo typesetting, but through putting macros into the instructions that we could control a lot more of the output. And so that the galleys that came out, what got pasted up, actually had the they had the headlines and subheads and the text. You know, all of that was in place. So we had less paste up to do. So this was probably in the mid-80s. So <laughs> this was, yeah. <laughs> well, this was before the... I think this was before the Mac, so maybe 82, something around that. So we were actually like there at the forefront of trying to figure out how to um, generate the kind of typographic um, controls that designers would have um, much more easily and readily to come. We yeah. were we were able to to kind of generate that. And it was it was exciting and scary. And so I think I got you know, excited about being able to write some kind of code to be able to generate the type. That's fascinating to to have been immersed in that kind of, you know, that really like disruptive time, I suppose, where whole kind of, I suppose, lots of different jobs went, didn't they? Or just emerged into something new um, as the technology disrupted and, and the amount of time you would have saved as well. Um, yeah, but it, it, as you just said, you know, a lot of uh, specializations went away because mm. now the what what happened was the graphic designer now does it all. Yeah. You know, so you know we had we had people whose specialization was in typography. You know, and you know that different from the lettering because it would, took specialized equipment, and so that job went away, you know, the, mm-hmm. the kind of, you know, the pre-press production, like all that, everything is now in the hands of the designer. It's really interesting. And I'm probably going to be skipping back and forth quite a lot. But mm-hmm. um, when we think of what's happening now, and we've got this other huge disruptor, which is AI and mm-hmm. tools like Dali, right. um, you know, you can imagine that's going to have a similar impact. I mean, it's kind of scary and exciting because we don't really know where these things are going to go or how good they're going to get. It's just the speed at which the change is coming. I don't think most people understand how advanced it already is now. Yes. No, there is a lot. Like looking at at what's being generated by Dolly, it's hard not to (laughs) quiver in your boots. Um, But (laughs) I still think, you know, that I'm curious what artists and creative people will do with that technology. Mm. Um, But I just wanted to go back again to that moment um, when, again, in the 80s, um, when the Mac came out and there was a great division among graphic designers about (laughs) whether this was going to be the end of like professional graphic designers, you know, that the secretary would be doing, you know, the (laughs) newsletters and, you know, this was, would displace graphic designers 
or this was a new kind of tool and opportunity for designers. Mm. So it kind of, in that sense, feels familiar yes. to have this technology. Um, yeah. So what AI will do, what we can do with machine learning, um, what, you know, with with things like Dolly, you know, what what will what will that disrupt? What will happen with that? Um, so it is both um, terrifying and exciting. Yeah, exactly. And and I suppose your whole career has been defined by these sort of technological advances, these kind of big chapters that come along. And like you say, back in the 80s with the, the introduction of the Mac, I mean, that was huge. I yeah. mean, didn't he, didn't he do a whole kind of advertising um, campaign that was sort of based around um, uh, Orwell's 1984? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's of, the image that comes to my yeah. mind whenever I think, now, what was the date? Oh, yes, 1984. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So clever. And, and when you sort of look, read back and, and, and understand that actually the computer didn't work for that launch at that point, they had to sort of blag it a little bit, didn't they? Because they were moving so fast as things were advancing. Yeah. Um, and what was the program back then that they launched? Was it something Paint Pro? You'll know this oh, more than me. Oh, God. Uh, I want to say Paintbox or oh, something like that. Paint. I can't remember, I, I, I can't remember the name. <laughs> yes, I can't. But it was all, all I could think about was like Susan Kerr, you know, in her wonderful <laughs> graphics, you know, representing these these different functions. Yeah. But no matter how much comes in and changes, there's always the foundation of what you've learned as a graphic designer, isn't there, Louise? You know, you, you, you no, no technology can replicate what a human can do. No, it's really true. But I will say, you know, if, if design fundamentally is about meaning making, hmm. you know, it, and, and kind of like through, through visuals, through words and images, you know, if that's, the foundations of it, you know, that certainly remained, but meaning has gotten very complex in many ways because culture is so complex and who is recognized is so complex. Mm. So, you know, how one speaks and how one understands the audience, um, the degree to which, you know, you're culturally literate, like all of that now plays mm. into that. And so, yes, it's the same, you know, but how how it functions and what you need to understand at this moment seems different. Mm. I, I know I keep bringing uh, Dali up, but um, mm. there was a report that said it was very um, uh, biased. Um, so if mm -hmm. you kind of typed a prompt in that said, you know, give me um, a bunch of people working in an office, yeah. it would be white men. <laughs> Because yes. it's yep. at the moment learning from all of the imagery out there. So right. that's what it can't replicate. It can't understand the nuance, the the kind of the the complexity, the complex nature of humanity um, right. and and how the cultural shifts are happening as well. It, I don't think it would ever yep. be possible for it to understand that as a machine. Well, no, but it's, you know, the the learning, you know, if code is written by humans, yes. you know, <laughs> although there's discussion about whether artificial intelligence will eventually be able to write its own code, but it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's human generated, that code, those algorithms are written by humans. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, if there is a kind of like big change that happens, you know, it's in the kind of awareness that's going to come from education Mm -hmm. you know, about the the bias, you know, what's being perpetuated by how that writing mm -hmm. is taking place. Yeah. Um, I think that the other end of that that I, know, that I think is really important that is not frequently discussed is what's happening in business schools and how they understand the world and what their ethos is and what their values are. Mm. So, um, you know, this idea of a better world means different things to different people. Just think about, you know, make America great again, you know. Uh. Uh, oh, yeah, ex ex <laughs> exactly. So what does that greatness mean? And what is yeah. it that we share as a culture? And how do, how do we get to that, yeah. that place where, you know, where everybody has a sense of being valued? Mm. 
And you kind of have gone into education um, and you um, have been doing that for quite some time. What what, what was the driver for, for going and teaching the next generation graphic design? Right. right. So I mentioned, you know, there I am in the 1980s <laughs> you know, in Cambridge and meeting Muriel Cooper and recognizing that that big changes were on the horizon, um, you know, not only from the, you know, seeing what she was doing at the visual language workshop, which at first, you know, I actually had thought about applying there when it first opened. And um, you did have to be able to code. Um, and that was sort of a stumbling block. Mm -hmm. But at the time, I also, I started teaching. I've always been like a reader and, you know, so I could see also the impacts that, you know, the things that we were just discussing about, um, about, about culture and design's impacts on the culture mm -hmm. um, that I, I knew it was time for grad school. Like this was the moment. And it was probably, I think I was in my late 20s at the time. So, you know, yeah. it seemed kind of like. The, you know, it seemed like both, you know, I was old, <laughs> you know, which seems ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but it also, it was like clearly, you know, that was like clear. Okay, this is the time when you need some time to pull yourself out of the the practice and, and sort of think about things. But it was mm -hmm. also like the, I was getting worn out by the practice as well. I was thinking, oh, is this it? You know, <laughs> yeah. I was working in a corporate design office and, um, I was just like, uh, you know, if I have to keep doing this over and over again, you know, I'm going to have to move on to another, <laughs> another field. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that's that was sort of like how I got to going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. I think I think we've all had moments like that in our careers where we've gone, oh, my gosh, is, is this it for the rest of my life? You know, mm. you know, some people are quite happy that they, they can find progress in their own kind of path. But yeah, sometimes you have to sort of do something completely different or at least something different within your own field. Um, right. To, right. To get, get that yourself job satisfaction. to a different place. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how how did you um how did you find it then? I mean, um, I, you sort of uh, teach at CalArts. Um, yeah. Did you have how have you seen the sort of kids change over the years, and and how do they sort of differ today compared to when you first got started in teaching? Well, one thing that I you know I said you know I was you know in my late twenties. By the time I got to CalArts, I was in my early thirties, you know, just like arrived at that moment, you know, I understood what the practice was, yeah. knew I needed to kind of like pivot from that, knew at that point, I also wanted to teach, you know, so getting an MFA was important if I was going to teach. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, what we've seen is, you know, we've moved from an ideal of people who are in a similar position, at least have a few years of practice so they know what it means to go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, CalArts, you know, when I went there was, I don't, I don't want to say, it was, it was at that moment where um, it was picking, you know, it was, it was at the center of the storm of the zeitgeist <laughs> of a conversation about design in that moment you right. know, what we call postmodernism, <laughs> but, you know, where, des where design was becoming um, critical mm -hmm. um, and not just, you know, the proverbial handmaiden of industry, <laughs> you know, it was beginning <laughs> yeah. to like reflect on what it was doing culturally mm -hmm. and also um, on language and the privileged language versus a much broader inclusive language. It's interesting that that's the conversation we're having today, but that was the conversation that was going on in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And I just um so, you know, people were attracted to CalArts because it was the you know, it was the it was the place where this deep conversation, reflection, you know, really experimentation with visual form that was coming out of these conversations. Yeah. Um, and people who were feeling 
um, dissatisfied or restless, you know, in their own careers. So I think that there has been all kinds of evolutions from that moment. The students uh, are younger today. They, I think they feel pressed um, coming out of their undergraduate education to continue their education. Um, the students are much more global now. Yes, yeah, of course. Um, so that's all changed. Yeah. And and do you ever sort of yourself personally worry that you, you're you not sort of keeping up with it because it's just changing so fast? I feel like it's sped up the cultural shifts that we're seeing. And it's, you know, it's good, but it's just, there's a lot to digest. We're bombarded with so much information. Um, the mm -hmm. world's much more close. You know, th these are all good things, but they come with some kind of um, downsides, don't they? Yeah. So there are definitely moments when I go, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm too we all have that. <laughs> we all have yeah. that. I'm too disconnected. There's too much of a spread between uh, the generations. Mm. You know, I, I know that at the same time, you know, there's also, there's, there's, there's awareness one of, um, I have, you know, hopefully I bring the value of kind of like a much broader perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, and just having been on the planet for so long, sort of awareness <laughs> of the patterns that happen and the things that have happened that hopefully I can bring to the conversation mm -hmm. that maybe provide insights. But the mythology, there's also kind of mythology in there. And the mythology is that um, the, the, the educator is all knowing, <laughs> yes. you know, that, <laughs> so, you know, all you can do is bring yourself to that space and hopefully you're a great kind of like, um, question asker, you know, um, that you're able to help somebody on their path. Yes. Um, and, you know, and that you can engage in some kind of conversation. So you don't have to be all knowing, Mm -hmm. You have to be able to provide, you know, help, support, you know, be able to ask the questions, engage that conversation. But you don't have all the answers. I mean, none of us do. Um, that's yeah. what kind of makes it all very exciting. We're always learning and growing. I thought I thought you were a goddess in the graphic design world, Louise. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Now you see feet of clay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so I guess we we can see that the passion comes through. You you wanted to sort of pivot and give back. Um, so where does this um, drive come from to kind of look back and document things within your field? Because, you know, I know we're going to come on to the archive in a minute, but um, yeah. this isn't the first time that you've sort of, you know, gone and done a bit of research and brought things together for books and other sort of projects along the way. Um, you know, you did your book about earthquakes, mudslides, fires and riots, um, spotlighting West Coast design history, which I yeah. bet was just joyous. It was um, joyous and painful at the same <laughs> the same time because it, yeah. you know it just wasn't you know clear that I could like point to something and say you know that's mm. West Coast design unless you you know yes yes there are people who were here who did work that was that was quite distinctive you know April Griman is probably like the poster girl for that yeah. um, but you know how you define that and what happened before, you know, the sort of like computer revolution or certain like new wave aesthetic, like, well, well, what was that? Um, and I've, I think, you know, if I had to describe myself, you know, again, this idea of a kind of rebelliousness, and it was that rebelliousness that was cultivated by um, getting my graduate education at CalArts, like that's, you know, that was the thing that I was attracted to, uh, you know, and knew the minute I like walked into that place, which was a complete accident that I went, <laughs> went to CalArts at all, you know, and saw it and realized it was the right place for me. But that, that, that rebellious spirit, um, you know, pushing against something. So 
in California, you know, graphic design. It was realizing there was this like community of people in California who were rejecting what had gone before. Mm. And I saw that in working on this show um, as an exhibition designer for um, the um, the exhibition um, Made in California um, Art, Image and Identity, 1900 to 2000, um, and realizing that artists had also rejected definitions from Europe and from New York. And so what was happening in California? So it was this, you know, I think I was driven by that rebellion and a kind of curiosity to do that that crazy uh, project. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and to look for that. I think I'm getting off track with your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just so fascinating because I always, I always like to know what, what dro- drove someone to do that because obviously that yeah. would have been um, a lot of work and a lot of slog and uh, yeah. sometimes pulling hair out, you know. Um, oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, these these are passions. We wouldn't do them. We wouldn't suffer if we didn't enjoy them. Um, yeah. And California itself has such an impact on the rest of the world. So yeah, it yeah. must be so fascinating being in the heart of that and seeing I it just, spread. It, <laughs> yeah, it's well, of course, you know. The, the, but aside from the food, <laughs> you know, and the technology, you know, here in Southern California, it's a cliche about um, the sense of light here, but I realized I thrive on that. Mm. You know, I need that light. It, it does, um, there's something that sort of shifts my sense of possibility and mood in having perpetual sunshine and light, you know, not that um, there aren't downsides to that, you know, but it also gives that, that sense of freedom here. Mm. Um, I think, um, you know, it's just, It's just not a place that's so married to tradition and the past. And that is both, you know, terrible (laughs) because you're kind of untethered, but it also represents a kind of uh, freedom and liberation. All those cliches about California. Yes, there's a lot of cliches. (laughs) You were never tempted with New York then? Oh, I was definitely tempted with New Mm -hmm. York. But when I, before I came to the West Coast, the East Coast was all I knew. Mm. And um, even as a like six-year-old, I was enamored with New York. I don't know why to this day, but there was something about, you know, maybe it represented a different kind of like rebellion and freedom to me, like (laughs) like anything could happen in New York. So I always, you know, thought I'm going to end up in New York and never did. Uh, as soon as I landed in California, which was like 1989 or 1990, when I first visited here, I went, I, I really thought I had like died and gone to heaven. Like this Aww. was it for me. You know, I knew I'd found my my home. Mm. Oh, because you grew up, um, it, it looks like you were sort of destined to be, to be a graphic designer and do what you do, Louise, because your father was an art director. And your mother was a newspaper columnist. So you had that kind of exposure from a young age. Right. Um, with those parents. I mean, did obviously they supported you going to the West Coast, but it must have been hard leaving everything behind um, over that other side of the country. Because it's not, it's not that it's just a sort of hot step, you know, quick jump over. Um, how yeah, did it take well. <laughs> some adjusting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think I was at a moment when, the expectation was for kids to like leave home yeah. and, and, and move away. I think now um, I think there's a reconsideration or a reckoning with the value of, of family. Um, but yeah, I, I think, you know, I think my father did want me to grow and succeed professionally. And so I think there was a, an embrace of, going somewhere else. Yeah. And, you know, from Florida, they were in Florida. And I went back to Boston where, you know, that was where I had been born and just like Mm -hmm. wanted to return there. Um, So I, and then, you know, coming out to California, 
you know, it just didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it, it, it felt fine. It felt fine. Yeah. And I wasn't, you know, I would just wasn't that close to my family. Yeah. Um, and so it all, it, there wasn't that hardship as well. Yes. You're, you've always been a free spirit in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I feel I can relate to that. I love my family, um, <laughs> but uh, I could I could easily live on the other side of the planet as well. Don't worry, Mum, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so so this is um, a, probably a ridiculous question to ask you, and I hate it when people ask me. But um, considering that one of your books is about women of design, um, then I feel like I've got the artistic license to ask it. You know, okay, has, yeah. Has your sex ever impacted your career in any sort of negative way? Or is that a kind of, you know, negative slant? Or has it sort of not been something you've noticed at all? Um, I, you know, it's, it, it is a fraught question, um, hmm. you know, and it was one that I had conversations with uh, Jerry Cavanaugh about, which a colorful life, Jerry Cavanaugh designer, was about her career. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that um, you, you, you buy the Kool-Aid, you drink the Kool-Aid, you know, <laughs> and you don't realize it's Kool-Aid, you know, yes. at a certain point. Um, you know, I have been part of, you know, feminist movements, you know, from the 60s, and then the reckoning that happened in second wave um, in, um, in the eighties, you know, I was there when the conversation went, went on about like who was excluded from mm. feminism. Um, so I, you know, it's only in retrospect that I realize, <laughs> you know, the degree to which I may have been positioned a certain way, but you lo- you use what's in your toolkit at the time, mm. you know, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you become aware of situations as time goes on, but it is in this moment now where it will, um, where I think women have a voice in the workplace and where, um, I'd like to perceive that it won't be tolerated, but I also know that I am not in that workplace right now, and mm-hmm. I don't know fully what what's what's going on. But I, as you can tell, have a very uh, difficult time answering that question. I think we all do. We yeah. all really struggle. Um, it's it's a very complex uh, question with yeah. each one of us. Unable to begin, know where to start. But I think you you say it very eloquently in that we we have all just drank the Kool Aid and um, it's just it's just the way it is. And and it, you the, there's a sense of guilt that comes with it, isn't there? That we didn't like speak up more or um, stand our ground more. But I suppose at the time you don't really kind of know it's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, to some degree, or you. You know, there's a, a a dawning, but like I said, I mean, you know, and this is a you know just a huge difficult conversation about like you lo- use the tools that are in your 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 toolkit. You you, do. you manipulate in your in you know using what you you have, exactly. You know, and it's a terrible way to kind of like think about it, mm. um, but it is. But there. You know, there is no situation that I can think of, doesn't mean it didn't happen, where I felt uh, bias against myself because I was a woman. I had one crappy boss and it wasn't like, you know, he he was a misogynist. He was just a misogynist. And, and what, hmm. you know, it, you know, that is probably the closest thing I could come to. He was just a shit. He was a shit person. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you wonder, is it about, you know, sexism or is it just that they're just not a very nice person? And, you know, that's where it gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, so, mm. With all the kids coming and enrolling on the course today, mm. is is there a difference to who those people are? 
Has it sort of changed a lot from since the time you began teaching? Um, well, we had talked a bit about, you know, it's now, you know, the, the students are coming from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like fascinating. You know, in some ways, this is like the dream, you know, <laughs> that we could have, you know, people from different kind of cultural upbringings to be part of the conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, just getting that conversation going alone is is the challenge, especially yeah. when you have younger students who may not feel confident in their own voice. You know, and I mentioned that when I went to school, I was a bit older and I remember being frustrated because I was, um, you know, I wanted to like get in those trenches, you know, have a, have a hefty discussion, you know, and argue things through. And that wasn't um, where the other students were at the time. And so it was kind of like, it was sort of frustrating to me, but I found, you know, I found other people and other parts of the school where I could have those conversations. But that's what I like crave most and want to, you know, if I had to like conquer one thing in the classroom, it's how to how to um, bring that out, the kind of the sense of get on that soapbox, you know, state yeah. what is your position? What are you arguing for? What are you arguing against? You know, how do you see that things should should be or you know what do you see as the problem like where is that that passion where you find your own voice it's only through that kind of impassioned um feelings you know and emotions that are that are channeling through you do you find a a voice and that you actually do have something to say and being in school is the place to kind of like be awkward and stumble through it and you know be embarrassed and you know um have a sense that, well, maybe that was stupid, or maybe I didn't think that through, but I just, I'd rather the passion came through first. And then as you're hearing yourself, you become aware of, oh, I need to think about this more. I need to read about this more. Mm -hmm. And what I encourage and don't do enough myself, um, although, you know, in one sense, I realize I do, you know, (laughs) is like that daily reflection You know, writing, you know, it's only through writing, you know, with oneself, you know, for oneself, that you're able to sort of work out what's in your head. You see it on paper, you give it words, and suddenly you're like, oh, um, I see what this is now. I'm giving it a shape. Yeah, that's fascinating. That like you just described how I felt last week as well. As well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Okay, so now let's talk about this archive because mm. we've just recently written about it on Creative Boom and it's yeah. so fantastic. The People's Graphic Design Archive. Um it's been in the making for a while though, hasn't it? Yes, I you know, it was a you know, I tend to come up with these ambitious kind of insane ideas. <laughs> and they, they're larger than life uh, and they don't seem possible. But somehow at the moment that they're conceived, it's like, well, yes, I, I, I can do that. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting in a meeting at the L.A. County Museum of Art because they just um, w- had started to collect graphic design and wanted to have a conversation with other curators and historians and archivists of design on what would um, be the kinds of issues they're confronting and collecting and in exhibiting graphic design. It was an amazing conversation. It was at that moment, you know, where my heart was, um, you know, Earthquakes was this book on California graphic design was at press at that moment. And I'm thinking, California graphic design, what about California graphic design? (laughs) And I'm realizing, you know, they only know so much. They're only aware of so much. What about all that other stuff that needs research? Because doing the book, I just came across so much, you know, and threads to things that there was no way I was going to get the chance to research. And so I thought, oh, my God, you know, it's going to take an army of people like unearthing this, you know, so that (laughs) so that um, LACMA, LA County Museum of Art, could see this stuff and they could go 
oh yes, we, God, well, you know, this thing, we should include this in our collection. Uh, and so, you know, I'm thinking about technology and, oh yeah, if, you know, if we could crowdsource this and it can be a virtual archive, you know, at least there'd be a record of it, you know, it wouldn't be perfect. It's not like a physical archive, but it'd be something because all that stuff is not going to an archive. There's not many of them, um, especially for graphic design. Although there's a lot of archives that have graphic design in it, but they're not mm -hmm. called graphic design archives. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this was a way to have a record. Um, and eventually, you know, realizing that so many more people who had been excluded um, could also, uh, their work could be preserved and documented. And so I, good. And it's, yeah. it, I love, I love <laughs> how, I love how the whole premise of it is that, you know, anything can be put in there. It's not like, um, there's, there's no kind of like, I'm assuming this is the case. Um, there's nobody sort of deciding what's good graphic design and what's bad graphic design. So then in that way, it's inclusive. Um, yes. Yeah. Because there's something to learn from all of it, isn't there? That's exactly it. I mean, I grew up in a moment, um, and it was that decisive moment for me about the graduate school, is that it was it was modernism or nothing. And, you know, I understand why um, modernism, um, you know, international style, whatever we want to call it, was important at that moment when I was being educated and how I understood graphic design in that moment. Um, but... I recognize now that there was a lot of other work being done by other people that was not acknowledged because it did not meet the standards of excellence you know, <laughs> and good graphic design and the kind of gatekeeping around that. So mm -hmm. yes, um, it was. It, this is about letting everybody decide what is part of that history, and out of that, you get a much wider range of work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and taste that has informed it, you know, and an understanding that it functions in different ways for different audiences. It feels very Californian, if you don't mind me saying so. I like it. I like yeah. it. I mean, we do want it to be global, but I think what you're talking about might be in, in a kind of ethos, again, that <laughs> sense of like, freedom <laughs> coming freedom. together you know the, the kind of you know yeah the, the, yeah the political the political things that you've seen happen in in your lifetime and and in mine you know yeah it's that kind of coming together yeah um, but I, I'm, I'm now streaming in my head the coca-cola commercial that you know <laughs> Oh Mad yes, what was that? ended with yes. Oh yes, yes. Oh, did yes. you watch that? Did you enjoy that? <laughs> yes. Mad yes. Men. Yes, very much. I was having, you know, trauma though. It was very traumatic for me. <laughs> you know, it to was. Watch that. Yeah. It was awful, wasn't it? Simultaneously <laughs> disliking um, uh, uh, Don Draper, but also yeah. just the way the kind of camera followed him from behind around and he was wearing all those kind of lovely sharp suits. And I was like, I'm so confused right now. <laughs> it's <laughs> yes, like yes. tapping into a sort of strange part of my conscience. Yeah. <laughs> Why do I find him attractive? Why do I find dickheads attractive <laughs> right oh yeah yep the conflict the conflict the conflict goes on um but yeah oh gosh mad men yeah it, was do you, was there any of that really true was it sort of you know a little bit more fictional than actually what kind of happened and went on in that time i mean i i know that's way before the way before your time but did you ever hear yeah. stories from your mother for example of what she had to deal with, or did you not have that kind of relationship with your mom? Well, no. So, you know, I was, I had a front seat to this because my mother, um, she ended up working in um, printing, um, hmm. in commercial printing. And um, so she was, you know, uh, a kind of a related business, you know, and was, was, was dealing with a lot of uh, design offices, um, advertising agencies. And so, you know, I did have a front seat. She got me in, an internship or an apprenticeship in an ad agency at the time. Wow. So I was like right there watching what she was 
going through, you know, what she was confronting. And she was, my parents were divorced at this time. And oh. so she had to, um, you know, bring in a, a, an, an income. You know, she was uh, responsible for my sister and I. And so she had to be a professional. Um, and, you know, being in that ad agency, um Everybody was kind of like wonderful there. Um, and I eventually was hired as an art director at that ad agency. So they recognized something. I was mentored um, by a creative director at that ad agency who had come from J. Walter Thompson in New York. And this was in the era of the big idea. Mm-hmm. Um and I think we're starting to witness some of that in Mad Men. <laughs> um, but, you know, the women had their 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 roles. Um, you know, I you know, I just had this flash of this moment, like when I did get out of school um, in uh, 19. 19- 76, I think it was, <laughs> um, you know, going to get a job at, at Tupperware or going for an interview at Tupperware. And it was like, you had to wear a skirt. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, you know, I kind of got the sense that I'd be, you know, sort of an office girl with, you know, sort of like design skills, you know. So it was there. Again, I did, I wasn't, I wasn't in that position where I felt frustrated. I felt, you know, overlooked because I was a woman. Um, but I know I, I when I watch Mad Men, I can feel my blood pressure going up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand those challenges. And I, it's probably from, you know, watching things that my mother had to go through. <sighs> Gosh. Well, let's let's hope it continues to get better, obviously. Um, so is it's obviously important for you to document what was before. Um, you know, why is that? Why do you think it's important that we bring all this stuff together and remember it and celebrate it and have it there for other people to sort of access? What, what's the sort of, what's the key driver behind all of that? Because, you know, this stuff just usually gets forgotten. And Right, right. So, you know, if we look at design history, you know, it's often described as kind of like the history of the greatest hits, Hmm. you know, the work. But I'm I'm part of this group that's working uh, AIGA Los Angeles um, and I think Orange County and San Diego are also involved. And we're working with the state of California um, on helping to shape. Uh, the curriculum um, that will give more people access to a graphic design education at the high school and community college level so that we change the image of who Mm. participates and can practice graphic design. So it is a a kind of political motivation (laughs) that is ultimately behind this. Um, We are also changing a picture of who participated in graphic design and what does it look like and trying to undo the mythology that this thing is graphic design, but this thing is not graphic design. So it's getting rid of that, that gatekeeping where everybody belongs, everything belongs, everything participates. I do, I'm not necessarily arguing for doing away with the canon, (laughs) the greatest (laughs) hits, But what those greatest hits mean, um, why they may be significant, I think, you know, at CalArts where Lorraine Wilde teaches historical survey, not (laughs) the history of graphic design, you know, and by the way, I want to mention that is where the first course in graphic design history was taught by um, Keith Goddard and later Lou Danziger. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it is like... What changes happened that that drove this practice forward? You know, and that might be um, aesthetic change or cultural change or um, change in relation to commerce, or it might be technological change. 
um, the, you know, it might even be a change in the way graphic design is taught. <laughs> um, but, you know, understanding what are those contextual conditions, you know, are important. So there's a different kind of like conversation around which you can talk about the work. And so I hope, I think what, you know, when you look at the history of graphic design and you look at it in the People's Graphic Design Archive, you realize it was much more complex. Mm. There were a, a wide range of motivations for the work. And depending on the lens that you look at that history through and what do you think it is that's significant that may have evolved the practice of graphic design, that you have a resource for that. When you say gatekeepers, do you mean that predominantly white um, white men have been predominantly in history, been doing the work and then have decided thereafter what's what makes good graphic design and therefore um, that's kind of like become the thing for many decades? Or am I sort of going down the wrong path there? What, what do you mean when you say the gatekeepers? So gatekeepers can be... Um, can be anybody who is uh, deciding this is good graphic design, you know, this is excellence. um, And we're going to, um, we're going to highlight this. So it happens in publications, you know, they just, you know, you know, you have a writer who, you know, or you have a publisher or an editor and they're aware of certain things and they're talking to certain people who may have made them aware of certain things that are going on. So somebody, you know, people get forwarded, they get published, they get talked about, you know, so there's that that machine. So that's a kind of gatekeeping, you know, yeah. uh, there's the competitions, you know, and who had access to those, those competitions. Like there's many times I didn't enter a competition because they didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. To enter that competition it was as simple as that, and so if you're in yeah. a kind of uh, corporate situation, you know we're able to like <laughs> uh, be able to enter those, and you have the sort of staff to be able to do that. So there, there's all these like sort of um, you know mechanisms through which um, people and and certain work got known. It doesn't mean that it's not worthy. Now, I want to go back. I mentioned that it was Keith Goddard, and uh, then he turned over his design history course to Lou Danziger when Keith left CalArts. Um, it was what had been published and what they wanted to share with students as kind of models of what was going on in graphic design at the time um, was because that, you know, they got access, and it wasn't easy access, to books that had published that work or magazines. You know, there were a few design publications at the time. Um, And so they could um, shoot slides of that and share it with students. And so, you know, that becomes the psyche. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, as more graphic design programs evolve, you know, that those you know, and more books become written about these things that are being taken and evolving as kind of like the history of graphic design. You mm-hmm. know, it's and and it was a big deal for the that first course that Keith Goddard taught. Um, you know, he he really had to like dig, as did Lou Danziger, to find things to share with the students. It just mm. the access wasn't as what it feels like today that we have access to everything. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I always like to say that behind every great, well-known graphic designer is a really good PR agency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I, I suppose, you know, publications and people like myself are to blame as well a little bit in that respect because we will often say, oh, they're, they're, that person's having a talk, so they must be important we'll write about them too (laughs) and so it goes around and it's the wonderful machine (laughs) yeah yep I mean it's 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 changing now I mean yes I I see you know the podcast that you've done that you talk to a lot of different people I try yeah Yeah. it's it's the the uh, insecure discussion with your husband late at night oh that rival podcast that's doing really well they've just interviewed that big name that I haven't yet should I do the (laughs) same and I always just get a really solemn no you're doing fine keep 
keep uh, inviting lots of different people. I'm like, yes. okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard though. It's really hard because you can find yourself falling into that trap, especially with all these exhibitions that are going on these fantastic books. But you try and balance it out, don't you? And um, you, you try and sort of have a nice spread. But the thing I love about this archive that you've spearheaded, that you're co-founder of, is that it sort of takes away all of that because it just puts it in the hands of everyone and anything can go into it. Is that right? Anything can go into it as long as people sort of follow the instructions and upload what they need to do? Yeah. So first, I, I want to mention that, you know, there are four co-directors. So I'm yes. part of an amazing group of women. So Briar Levitt and Brockett Horn and Morgan Searcy. Um, you know, these women are all just incredible. There would be no People's Graphic Design Archive without them. Um, it's just been an amazing experience. So everybody um, we've fallen into, not because it was assigned in any way, but we've all fallen into different roles. We have different kind of capacities and expertise, and it just worked very harmoniously. Um, you know, we make decisions collectively, but everybody has kind of like realm. Um, Briar Levitt is the moderator for the archive. And um, so she's essentially the person who pushes the button and it, and it goes up because <laughs> that's the only threshold. So the only thing is, you know, occasionally we get something like the example I always use is somebody might send a picture of a painting. Well, I actually <laughs> use the example of a chair, like, you know, okay, how is it graphic design? You know, we'll send a note. But occasionally we get like a painting. And so we're like, okay, um, you know, a note will have to go to the person who uploaded it to say, okay, you know, we're just wanted to understand how you see this as graphic design. And so yeah. it's just that question. So we're trying not to police it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Sometimes we do. If something is less than 10 years old, that it also gets a kind of um, a query or a note saying, oh, you know, we love that you've uploaded this. Um, and we may have to make the decision if it's something um, that we see as like significant in this moment, we'll simply tag it future history. Amazing. Um, we want people to upload their own work but we have this line to walk between archive and portfolio site. Yes. Um, and so that also, you know, we'll just say, you know, can you hang on to this, you know, for a few years if somebody uploads something they did recently. Um, we are the horn, the dilemma that we're having right now, for instance, we're, there's a lot of like protest graphics that we feel an urgency to preserve coming out of Iran, um, you know, coming out of... Uh, the women's are, movement there, yes. Yes, yeah. We feel like, you know, just to use as as an example, the Black Lives Matter, you know, everything that happened after the, the murder of George Floyd, like we, we, we want to capture that material. Yeah. So, you know, again... We may make the decision to just tag it future history. In our perfect site, you know, <laughs> and just to have gotten to phase two, I mean, to phase one was amazing, but phase two, we hope that there is a parking lot, which is essentially the future history parking lot. And the moment, the date, you know, it hits the 10 year date, you know, <laughs> it, it comes up into the archive. You know, that's what we really want because we, we, we do feel an urgency to, to capture and preserve this material that will be very significant um, oh, wow. for researchers, scholars, you know, anybody who's just interested in the cultural moment and wants to understand it better through the kinds of messages that people created. We always knew that graphic design was important, but you've just somehow made it essential um, mm -hmm. and just really kind of got got everybody thinking about how it's sort of so connected to what's going on around us and hopefully it can sort of solve some of those problems in that you have those different perspectives and you know the visual communications that are put out in future are more con considered and reflective of the way we're growing as as people um, yeah. and how we want 
all of those voices to be heard. You know, you say going back to what you were saying before about how you want your students to just speak up. Um, it, it feels like this archive is coming at the right time. There's a there's a huge appetite for it. Mm. People want people want yeah. to see see progress, I guess, and and yeah. this can be part of that. Right. Yeah. At the same time, they're destroying the progress. They want to see progress. You know, it's that that strange polarization that that happens. You know, yeah. one thing I wanted to mention is, you know, the contextualization of what's being uploaded and capturing that. Like when people upload like something they see on the street, you know, a poster or something, mm -hmm. you know, being able to understand that context, you know, being able to capture that context. So um, being able to capture something that sh that shows the, the context, you know, so the shot is a wider shot as well as, you know, capturing the, the graphic artifact as well, putting in some kind of description, you know, of where and how it was seen, mm -hmm. you know, particularly if you were part of that protest, you know, so understanding that moment, like capturing that in the, you know, about, or, you know, what we would call a description um, of the item is um, significant to add. I hope people will think about that. The other thing is being a, for somebody to be able to find it, it's how it's tagged. Mm. So there's an urgency to getting people to tag what they upload to the archive so that it shows the whole range of how it might be relevant, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to somebody. And really using your imagination, um, not only how it's like meaningful to you, but how you can imagine it might be meaningful for somebody else so that when they're doing a search, it will show up. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's how the the um the archive becomes relevant and valuable oh, so it's so fascinating i can't begin to imagine where this thing's going to be even in just five years time let alone 10 and and the resource that it will become and i'm sure you'll have like new headaches to deal with <laughs> as you're trying to figure out oh my yeah. goodness we're bombarded how do we deal with all this kind of amazing thing you know well yes i mean you know our next step is also about thinking about the sustainability of the project you mm -hmm. know economically and in terms yeah. of you know how um it's you know how it's run and who runs it you know we're yeah. we're part of the letter form archives um digital collective so they don't own us um they are our fiscal sponsor um, but we are, we have an association, you know, they're not financially responsible for us, but it feels like, oh, that's, you know, that home, you know, gives us some security, um, uh, you know, um, for one thing, um, uh, Stephen Coles and Kate Long, who are there, um, Johnny Abbott Smith, uh, the executive director, Rob Saunders, who are all champions of the project, but also um, we bring expertise that we don't have. Mm -hmm. um, and that alone is just our kind of like gold and feels like our insurance that we'll be able to sustain ourselves because we have these um, experts that are behind us that are um, able to um, tell us like, oh, you have this situation Here's how you can respond in that in that situation. Like Kate, you know, helped us shape um, our, our databases because, you know, she's a librarian. You know, she understands, you know, how how archivists work, you know, and not it's not about standards. It's about, you know, what what do we need to capture so that it will be of value, you know, and that the work can be understood um, and. You know, how do we make it easy for people at the same time if people feel intimidated or feel like this is too much work? You know, we lose them. So we have to, you know, Kate has just been so generous in helping us to find this balance. And so just uh, Stephen Coles just like knows everything about like everything, it seems. You know, he was he has uh, fonts in use uh, along with four other um, gentlemen 
And, uh, you know, that's an incredible resource. And that's a crowdsourced virtual collection. And that was the model on which the People's Gravity oh, Plane Archive was built. So, so good. The advice that we've gotten from them and the generosity, unbelievable. And it's all, you know, thanks to, to all of them that, that um, we've been able to thrive and, and hopefully are able to sustain what we're doing. Well, it's it's going to be so interesting to see how the project evolves over the next few years, mm-hmm. Louise. And um, mm-hmm. just with everything we've talked about today, when we've sort of looked back in history, you know, I think it'd be quite nice to ask how you feel about, you know, looking forward. Um, what what mm-hmm. are you hoping for? What what are you? Where are your sort of current thoughts at? Because we we're, we're intelligent people. I'm, reason- <laughs> I'm reasonably intelligent. And um, we, we often have things on our minds and things that we're hoping for. I mean, where do you find yourself at the moment? Yeah. So, you know, the things that I've mentioned are, the, you know, like the sustainability of the site, you know, how it how it grows and evolves um, in terms of like this future history, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um, that people feel comfortable uploading Getting um, people comfortable with uploading also means that they're comfortable doing research and we have resources to hopefully make that easy for people and we're continuing to build that. So um, understanding in your own community, like engaging educators is particularly um, significant, especially as they're trying to change how they teach design history. So seeing that design history is not just something that you consume, you know, for Mm -hmm. students that they consume, but that they can also produce that by looking in their own communities at who may have been overlooked, you know, what's interesting to add to the history, but what needs to get documented. So one thing I call a design history emergency, and in fact, a couple of years ago, um, we made a presentation at the at AIGA Design Educators Community called Design History Emergency, you know, that was really about like people who may be more advanced in their years who have not been acknowledged and capturing their stories through doing oral histories. And Mm -hmm. Tony Best gave us a kind of like outline that we have is under the resources on our site, how to do an oral history fast and easy. Like, what do you need to know? So Brilliant. that you capture that person's story in their own words, that you don't have to find the crumbs of anything they may have left behind to understand their work. They tell you. And then to be able to capture that work. So we have documenting work fast and easy. So how do you just like photograph the work or scan it so that you don't feel overwhelmed, but that there is a record Um Adding to the site is so easy. Like people like think about, it, they go, oh, you know, it's too much work. But um, we worked with uh, Margot Halverson. All right. Um, who, yes. Yeah. <laughs> who, I, who I think you know from Design Inquiry. But yeah. there was also the main um, summer workshops. Um, and she had all the documentation from those workshops. Brilliant. And um, so we worked with her on a kind of like a, you know, a kind of like study a case study to see how easy it might be like what what do we need to provide somebody so that they could archive you know fast and easy so you can actually like just upload folders of materials to the archive so she just like you know she had a copy stand and she just like would photograph these notebooks that she had like page by page you know yeah. output them to a pdf and just mm-hmm. like as long as they share a few data points you can just like upload that PDF or a, a folder of JPEGs up to the archive. And there you have an in, somebody's entire like body of work easily preserved because there is so much work that, you know, and I saw this when I was doing the book on Jerry Kavanaugh. I know the day will come. Like some of her work is preserved, but a, the day is sadly going to come when a dumpster is going to pull up to her house. And those cartons are going to go in it. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, th- you know, it is the sad truth. We can't it preserve is. or save it all. So, you know, recognizing what needs to get preserved, realizing you can do it easily and preserve that. And that it is an amazing thing for educators uh, to be able to 
be engage their students in doing original research. You know, you'll also see on our site under resources something that um, Shika Arsenault, who um, is at uh, the University of Texas in Austin, you know, mm-hmm. created um, about like how to find design in your community. Because it seems obvious, so but it's not so It's easy. not. So, Building those resources to answer the question that was way back there, you know, like building (laughs) that resource, making it easier and easier, you know, getting the site like known, you know, so that people go, oh, you know, it's nothing to add to the archive. Or, oh, look at this amazing thing I just came across. I don't think people know about this. I'm just going to (laughs) like add it to the archive, you know, so it becomes like, you know, without a second thought, people are adding to the archive and you know, we have just like have this incredible amount of material of this like history that people had didn't know about, didn't recognize, you know, that is now preserved. Is it important for you to be remembered too, Louise? Um and I, the work that you've done? I hate to say it, but I have thrown out a lot of material of my own <laughs> because I just you know, it's it's hard to see myself, you know, and any value that I may have brought. Come um, on. I think that the, you know, the AIGA medal has been kind of a reckoning for me. It's, you know, it's brought in a lot of emotional turmoil, <laughs> I would say, um, huh. because, um, you know, I I think it's just, you know, The insecure, it brings out all the insecurities at the same time that you go, okay, well, maybe I did something. Yeah, it's, it's, I I just, I think sometimes it's, you know, this turning the lens on myself when I'm not sure, you know, or the the light on myself when I'm just like not 100% sure about it. And I know like how many people were at my back and at my side. Um, you know, that I, I wasn't alone and that the contributions that other made, other people made were huge. Well, you know, I, I'm going to have to disagree with that. But, you know, um, you, you have made a massive difference and, and this is just a phenomenal thing that you're doing and it must bring you so much satisfaction with everything that you've done throughout your career so far. Um, so thank you, Louise, for chatting with us today about the archive and and a little bit about your about your experience of the world of graphic well, design it's been fun katie <laughs> thank you for inviting me to to be here and to chat this has been great i'm sorry we're not having coffee or a drink and oh don't you London. worry if i if i come across <laughs> to the west coast i'll i'll definitely give you a shout oh, please do please do <laughs> To discover more about Louise Sandhouse, you can find everything you need via our show notes at creativeboom.com forward slash podcast. That's where you can also hit subscribe and check out our entire archive of episodes so far, including chats with Elliot J. Stocks, Annie Atkins and Harrison Wheeler. Next time, we'll chat with Moes, an art director, artist and designer from Manchester. See you then. See you then.